Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Some of you may know my first book, The Net Delusion, where I try to uh, question why there is so much effort and so much persistence in Silicon Valley, um, and increasingly in places like Washington, to build digital tools and fixes and apps uh, that can help us bring democracy to various authoritarian states. This quest of building apps and solutions to problems that are very complex and are very hard to define and are very hard to establish uh, even contours uh, around them. This is a quest I've uh, continued examining in, in my new book where I shifted my attention from uh, trying to understand authoritarianism and what technology can do for it to understanding some of the um, ongoing challenges and um, efforts to solve them that we see in liberal democracies. And I heard very much similar rhetoric coming from the likes of Google and Facebook. You would listen to Eric Schmidt or Mark Zuckerberg and they would very explicitly say that we do not wake up to make money, uh, we do not necessarily respond to uh, what shareholders expect of us in the, long, in the short term. We are essentially um, almost a quasi-humanitarian sector with its own social and political aspirations. So I started following that rhetoric and I tried to understand where do such efforts to improve the world, where do they come from and where do they eventually lead. Uh, where they come from for me was a bit easier to understand, uh, in part because uh, some of this world-saving rhetoric coming from Silicon Valley uh, clearly uh, tries to delay regulation of their own activities. Right? It's uh, much harder to go and regulate companies like Google and Facebook if they do present themselves as essentially helping us deal with social and political problems. Uh, they're not the likes of ExxonMobil or Halliburton. They are the likes of Transparency International or Human Rights Watch. At least this is how they would like us to think about their activities. And it does make sense for them to play up this uh, revolutionary rhetoric um, when they speak in public. Uh, essentially, they are competing for the same talent with uh, Wall Street. Uh, it's the same computer scientists, uh, the same developers, the same engineers. Uh, the day after, and it's much better for Silicon Valley uh, to present itself as being in the business of changing or saving the world, uh, and then it very nicely contrasts with, Silicon, uh, with Wall Street, which does the very opposite, at least if you listen to Silicon Valley. So to give you uh, a very specific example of what I have in mind with the kind of world-saving rhetoric um, uh, that I'm paying attention to. So how many of you know uh, an app called Google Now? Google Now is uh, an app for Android phones which uh, basically um, tracks everything that you do in Google services, whether it's your Gmail, whether it's your calendar, whether it's perhaps uh, the box that you check out. It basically systematically tracks your activity across Google services and it does it in the background. Right? So it does it autonomously without you asking it to uh, go and, and, and monitor what it is you're doing. And if you, for example, have uh, an email plane reservation, Google now will recognize that you are about to catch a plane. It will automatically check you into your flight. It will check the weather at your destination. And it will tell you that it might rain, so you need to take an umbrella. Uh, and it will check the traffic conditions on the way to the airport in real time to warn you that you need to leave the uh, home sooner. And its purpose is to make life frictionless and to make life easier and to take some of the hassle out of our everyday existence. A few months ago, it went one step further. So it also started tracking not just what's happening in your inbox, or what's happening in your calendar, it's also tracking, because it's in your smartphone, it's also tracking how many miles you walk every month. And at the end of which month, it tells you that you've been walking this month so many miles, and this is how it compares to how many miles you walked the previous months. 
right? Again, that card pops up on your phone without you ever asking for it. The idea here is that there is something in your behavior that perhaps needs to be changed. And that thing got me thinking about the kind of infrastructure that now exists for problem solving, right? And that infrastructure has been built by Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, it allows for all sorts of behavioral modifications even if those modifications just happen at the level of nudging, as you see with this example with Google Now. Because essentially, what that uh, card telling you how much you've been walking is meant to do is to nudge you to think more about how much you've been walking. Right? So it fits very nicely with the kind of behavioral modifications that uh, a lot of uh, policymakers, both here in the US and elsewhere in Europe, have been very excited about. Right? And what I wanted to explore a little bit more are the kinds of alliances that can be built uh, between policymakers on the one hand who are looking for solutions to problems like obesity or problems like climate change. Uh, you can think of many problems that uh, need to be solved and that can be solved by essentially offloading some of the um, necessary interventions on the shoulders of the citizens. You have apps and sensors for monitoring uh, how you sleep, how well you sleep. They track you uh, even, even when you go to bed. You have sensors that monitor how much you're exercising. They track what you eat. And again, here the idea is that if we have the right infrastructure for steering your behavior, we can get you to do the right things, whether it's recycling or whether it's walking more or whether it's um, turning off the lights. The kinds of interventions that were impossible uh, just 10 years ago suddenly become possible. Right? If you wear Google Glasses and you show up at a restaurant at the end of the day, the Google Glasses already know what it is that you've been eating uh, all day long. They know how, much, uh, how many calories you've consumed. Right? So potentially, uh, nothing stops Google if it wants or if policymakers think that it's a good idea from making certain menu items disappear from the menu once you look at them through Google Glass, <laughs> right? It sounds like science fiction, but this is a possibility, right? It's no longer something that is off the table, right? And there are many other interventions that suddenly become possible that were impossible before, and the task facing us as citizens and as policymakers and as governments is to figure out just how much imperfection we would love to live in the system. When you're being asked to start exercising more, to be start walking more, to start consuming healthier food, um, there is very little effort paid to the broader structural environmental issues and environments in which you find yourself. Right? So you don't really hear questions about uh, the ability to access healthy food or to access infrastructure where you can actually go and do all that walking. If you're being asked to go and consume healthier food, but there are no healthier options because you need a car to drive to the farmer's market or because the food industry is poorly re regulated or because the only restaurants in your neighborhood sell junk food, it doesn't really help to be told that you need to be consuming more healthy food. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, there is completely no use for all sorts of informational interventions in how we consume things. But for me, the danger of um, using them as a substitute rather than a bonus to existing policy initiatives uh, is very great. And I do think that a lot of governments and a lot of um, policymakers, for reasons that have to do with austerity, that have to do with cost cutting, would not see those initiatives as a bonus. Right? And this is where we get into all sorts of other uh, issues and all sorts of other um, debates that I think need to be conducted on terms that are political and not just economic, uh, and not just terms that are about efficiency or innovation, which is how Silicon Valley likes to conduct those debates. My favorite example, which to some of you might sound very bizarre, but it's a project that was built by designers here in Britain and uh, designers in Germany, is this uh, smart trash bin. So what does the smart trash bin do? Uh, it looks like a regular trash bin, uh, but it has a smartphone uh, built into its upper lid, right? So every time you open and close the uh, trash bin, the smartphone snaps a photo 
of what it is you have just thrown away. Um, and that photo is being uploaded to a website called Mechanical Turk, which is run by Amazon, where freelancers are paid to do laborious tasks that uh, computers cannot handle yet. So those designers hired a bunch of freelancers who analyze your photos uh, in terms of how environmentally friendly your recycling habits are. So if you're recycling correctly, uh, you will be assigned points uh, that will then, along with the photo, end up on your Facebook profile. Right? And the idea is that you will tap into the logic of games, you will tap into the logic that you know, a lot of people in Silicon Valley call gamification, which is turning more or less everything into a game uh, in order to motivate people to do behaviors they wouldn't do otherwise. So you will tap into gamification to get people to recycle. One of the implications of uh, relying on gamification so that you can impress your friends by collecting points for environmentally friendly behavior is that all those photos end up being routed through Facebook. So technically, uh, any law enforcement agency can go to Facebook and discover what was in your trash bin three weeks ago. Suddenly, an act that was previously regulated by appeals to morality, politics, and ethics, in this case, an act of recycling, is suddenly recast in the language of uh, basically consumerism and you having to accumulate points, not because you worry about the environment, but because you can redeem those points to buy a latte or you can accumulate those points to impress your friends. And whatever efficiency that scheme brings, it brings with it also a certain language and a certain way of thinking that perhaps uh, is something that we need to debate a little bit more because you can easily connect this trend to broader trends about the spread of markets into everything that you know, people like Michael Sandel have been worried about. I just read a report that came out uh, earlier this month from Deloitte. You know, they, they're not crazy artists. They're serious people wearing ties. Um, <laughs> And they published a report on what they call virtual incarceration. And they're basically arguing that prisons in America are overcrowded, they're too expensive, now we have smartphones, we have sensors, we have all these cool technologies, we can just imprison people at home. They don't have to be in prison. Right? And it's a somewhat bizarre argument, but it's a very extended paper. It's a long paper that you know, they presented at South by Southwest Festival, including others. And one of the points they make is that we can now build gamification schemes uh, into basically incarceration services, right? So you can actually go and accumulate points with your smartphone that will be visible to your case manager by never missing your appointment with the said case ma manager or by never leaving the zone that you were consigned to. And then once you accumulate enough points, um, you will be able to you know, get better treatment in terms of curfew, or maybe you'll be eligible for early release. It's like a frequent flyer uh, program, <laughs> only that there is no hassle of flying uh, involved. Now that you do have your smartphone with you, and now that it is always connected, and now that you are present on Facebook, the kinds of behavioral modifications that happen because of uh, peer pressure, that happen because you are part of some competition, uh, suddenly become available. And again, it becomes, and often they work, right? Because they do tap into psychology, they do tap into lots of behavioral factors. Uh, they're built with a lot of you know, smart neuroscientists on staff. But the question then is, so okay, we have those more perfect ways of getting people to do things, whether it's recycling or whether it's showing up at elections, is it the kind of change that we want? Or would we rather settle on a more imperfect and efficient system where fewer people were to recycle, or fewer people were to show up at elections, but we still talk to them in the language of politics, morality, and you name it, and not in the language of accumulating points and redeeming lattes. One of the moves, strategically, policy-wise, and rhetorically, that will come as we all start to self-track, and as there are sensors built into all sorts of material environments, is that we will have a lot of data about correlations that we will have a lot of data about how changes in one variable affect changes in another variable. That we will know that people who share certain and like certain things on Facebook tend to engage in more crime than people who don't share or like certain things on Facebook. Right? And for me, the danger I think here, and you already, if you read some of the big books that were published recently about big data, they all celebrate this as you know, us finally being able to live 
the investigations of causality, and finally look at correlations as if it were enough to make decisions. And we will have lots of data for correlations, but the problem is that, of course, uh, to return to my example about sort of obesity exercise and, and infrastructure, like if you do have the correlation that people who tend to be fit also walk more, right, your policy advice based on that knowledge would be to give everyone a smartphone and to give everyone a pedometer so that you can measure how much you're walking. Right? It will not be the kind of reform that will investigate why on earth people are actually not walking enough. Right? It will not be the kind of reform that will understand that you actually do need infrastructure, you actually do need some kind of basic um, you know, interventions at the structural level, and not just interventions which will allow you to increase or decrease your performance within the existing system by monitoring your own behavior, by optimizing uh, a given variable. Right? Those kind of structural interventions are only possible if we go and start investigating what causes what and uh, investigate the questions of causality. You can't just tackle them through correlations. Thank you so much. This is a book one might wish to sort of lob as a brick through the windows of misguided policymakers. But when it comes to individuals who are, uh, if you like, consumers reading it, sure. what's the sort of practical advice for them? Because most people feel, at least, that they just can't go out and sort of and redesign the system or even necessarily sure. opt out. I want people to sort of think about this issue a bit more politically and to realize that I mean, I mean, so let me give you an example. So you can have sensors in your car that will track uh, how safely you're driving. And if you're driving, if you're a safe driver, then you're driving safer than the average driver, uh, you would be able to receive discounts on how much you're paying in insurance premiums from your insurance company. Right? That's the logic of self-tracking, and now you can track sort of any indicator about yourself, and then if you're better than the average person, you would be able to go and get preferential treatment from insurance companies, medical companies, all sorts of other institutions. The question is that, um, like, what does it do to people in our society who do not want to self-track for reasons that may have to do with privacy or may have to do with the fact that they don't enjoy perfect health and they're not safe drivers? And uh, if the system was uh, working according to different highly pers personalized rules, they would end up paying much more. Certain things would completely be unaffordable to them because they just look very risky. Right? And this is why I think you cannot just continue talking about what we as consumers should do because your decision to self-track will eventually affect my decision whether to self-track or not to self-track because once enough people reach the point where they want to self-track, it no longer becomes optional. Mm. Right? Because people who don't self-track are suddenly seen as people who are suspicious or have something to hide by, you know, by, by the insurance companies and the rest of the industry. Try, as a young person, try renting an apartment somewhere in New York without having a Facebook account. Mm. Uh, and try doing it through Craigslist. And I can assure you that increasingly you are facing more and more difficulty in doing that for the sole reason that a lot of landlords already demand to see whether you are a normal person, and by normal person, they mean someone who has friends on Facebook, who is social, and who is part of that new media ecosystem. So if you think that we can solve the privacy problem by passing better laws to protect data, and by giving people the tools to remain anonymous online, you're missing the most dangerous trend. And the most dangerous trend is that most people don't want to protect their data because by releasing their data, they'll get better treatment. They'll get better coupons. They'll get more discounts. They'll get more, far more preferential treatment than they're getting currently. Many of those choices, even though we would like to think of them as non-political, they are political. And this is where yeah. it's not enough to be thinking just as someone optimizing your behavior within the marketplace. Thank you, Evgeny. Thank you. Thank you.